And his, um, he had, he grew up in what was called the ethical culture school tradition. Okay. And so Oppenheimer was, was, was ethnically Jewish. Uh, and his parents were Jewish. Um, and when he was, he grew up in the ethical cultural school, which was an offshoot of sort of reform liberal Judaism. And, uh, and in many ways, the ethical cultural school was kind of the precursor to secular humanism. Okay. So he grows up in this very secular humanistic kind of background where he's, he's non-religious, but he learns about different religious traditions and is particularly struck by them, especially in relationship to Christianity, because like the, the famous nuclear test that happens in July of 1945 is called the Trinity test. Ah. Um, and then, uh, and then he was also very influenced by like Eastern spirituality and specifically the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Um, you know, that's where he, the famous line that's connected to him where he says in an interview, it's like I, I, when the, the Trinity test was successful and I saw the bombs and sort of saw the implications to the future, it was like that classic line, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Right. Hi and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, a podcast where we talk about a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Hi, Corey. How are you? Doing well. Yourself? Great, great, great. Yesterday was the solar eclipse, which was a pretty amazing thing. Uh, you know, I, I was in the path of totality. So for three minutes, it was like nighttime during the middle of the day. Right. And it was a pretty powerful and, and beautiful experience. I'm, I'm so glad to have been able to, uh, to be a, to be able to be downtown in Indianapolis to get it because that's where the weather was the best. There was less cloud coverage. So the weather was pretty good. And so, yeah, that was pretty beautiful. And, and then, and then we're recording this on your birthday today. So happy yep. birthday, man. Thank you. <laughs> that's pretty great. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So, um, so yeah, so tonight is the, the, the first of a couple of episodes we're going to do, um, on talking about the rise of the U S national security state, um, post world war two, um, world war two and post world war two in the U S and its implications sort of for, um, you know, global, you know, sort of global international relations and, 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 and prospects for peace and all of that. And thinking about, um, how did the United States kind of become the, the superpower that it did in the 20th mm -hmm. century? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there, without question, one of the ways that the United States became such a powerful, super, uh, powerful nation, um, in the middle of the 20th century was the development of the atomic bomb. Um, and so, uh, originally I wasn't going to do this book, but, but what inspired me to talk about it was that I had been on a great podcast called left of the projector. Um, and I had done that with, um, uh, with Evan who runs that show. And then Nathan, um, I think shoe Kirk, I, I always forget how to say their name. Um, schizophrenic reads on TikTok. Um, okay. you know, and, um, and we talked about the movie Oppenheimer, uh, the sort of smash hit last year directed by Christopher Nolan now winner of multiple Academy Awards yeah and we talked about the fact that that movie was based on a book um, and the movie's pretty darn faithful to the book and I thought there was so much more I wanted to talk about in the show that we didn't get to because we mostly talked about the movie and I was like I really wanted to talk about the book right and then I was like you know what let's just do it on our show <laughs> and so For tonight sure. we're going to be talking about um, American Prometheus, the triumph and tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by cool. Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. Um, uh, and I think, you know, in terms of general impressions, uh, this is easily probably one of the best biographies I've ever read. I think that it does a really good job of balancing talking about the science and talking about the politics. Um, okay. So, um, you know, Martin Sherwin was a journalist and, and, and author who had sort of worked on the Oppenheimer project for 25 years. And Kai Bird was another journalist and author who had written about the rise of the American sort of national security state in the 20th century. And so they sort of collaborated on this book. 
And uh, and I think that that they've really made. I think a I think it's a testament to how good biographical writing can be. Um, right. and, and and why the biography and biographical writing is kind of like my favorite form of history. It's often what I write about um, and what I'm interested in. So I, I love the book and I also really like the movie. But the reason I kind of want to talk about on the show was not just to talk about the rise of the national security state, but also to talk about how J. Robert Oppenheimer, who ran the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, um, they call him the father of the atomic bomb. Right. Was an extremely complex and, and complicated figure, and and in many ways he was probably the highest profile casualty of McCarthyism right. and the Red Scare. Um, and so uh, a lot of people um, know him now because of the movie, but uh, but that you know Oppenheimer was somebody who was very well respected. Um, during the period of developing the atomic bomb and, and shortly thereafter, and goes through a pretty harrowing experience of essentially having his life ruined by the government because he was willing to speak out about what he thought were serious dangers uh, emerging out of you know post-war national security planning during mm. the, the Truman and Eisenhower years. And uh, he paid the price for it, ultimately. Um, and so we'll sort of, that's kind of the broad sweeps, and then we'll kind of get into details. But um, but yeah, I didn't wasn't sure if there was anybody who's joined us or if you have any comments, questions. Well, just uh, some random geek is ha hanging out, watching the show. Well, hello, hello. Thank you, as always, for joining. Your little thumbnail's cute. That's fun. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, what's also interesting about Oppenheimer, and I think, you know, our interest in sort of talking about the left and talking about humanism and all these different kind of themes, he's kind of a part of all of that. And that's what makes him kind of fascinating. You would sort of think of the father of the atomic bomb as being this sort of like sort of right winger kind of reactionary yeah. asshole. And he wasn't. Right. Um, and so one of the things that struck me with the book was learning that, so he was born in 1904. He was born in, in New York City. Um, his parents were Jewish immigrants who had come over um, from Europe. Uh, and his, um, he, had grew, he grew up in what was called the ethical culture school tradition. Okay. And so Oppenheimer was, was, was ethnically Jewish. Um, and his parents were Jewish. Um, and when he was, he grew up in the ethical cultural school, which was an offshoot of sort of reform liberal Judaism. And, uh, and in many ways, the ethical cultural school was kind of the precursor to secular humanism. Okay. So he grows up in this very secular humanistic kind of background where he's, he's non-religious, but he learns about different religious traditions and is particularly struck by them, um, especially in relationship to Christianity because like the, the famous nuclear test that happens in July of 1945 is called the Trinity test. Ah. Um, and then, uh, and then he was also very influenced by like Eastern spirituality and specifically the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Um, you know, that's where he, the famous line that's connected to him where he says in an interview, it's like, I, I when the, the Trinity test was successful and I saw the bombs and sort of saw the implications for the future, it was like, that classic line, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Right. Um, and so, you know, Oppenheimer was someone who right away was an extremely precocious and prodigal child um, who learned very quickly. And his parents were sort of solidly middle class. Okay. Um, who, you know, his father, I think, was a tailor, was part of a tailoring business. And, uh, and so he grew up very comfortably, you know, he never really hurt for much. They weren't wealthy, but they were part of like a sort of middle-class, you know, ethical cultural tradition in Jewish communities in New York. And that was the one thing I realized. I thought that he was like, I thought he was European because so many of the people who worked on the Manhattan Project in the 40s were transplants from Europe. A lot of right. them were, you know, whether it was Hans Bethe or um, Edward Teller or whoever, like a lot of these guys came from Europe because they were they were refugees of, mm. of Hitler's Germany. 
but Oppenheimer was an American, which I, okay. I didn't know until I read the book. And that kind of, that was interesting to me. I was like, okay. And then it makes sense. They wouldn't have put a foreigner at the head of the project. They would have made an American. Um, and so he, uh, he, he eventually, uh, goes to college, um, and, and, and I think settles in Cambridge, uh, starting originally with chemistry that doesn't go particularly well. Uh, and he doesn't really like it. And that, okay. and then that gets to, if you've seen the movie or for those who've seen the movie, one of the early, you know, he sort of has a crisis in his twenties during his time, uh, in England, um, and has serious bouts of depression. He was, he was a very, he was a theoretical physicist. He was not okay. a practical physicist. So, at the time, you know, the, the schools of physics were often broken in between theoretical and, and experimental. And his, his brother, Frank, was actually a pretty good experimentalist and became a phys physicist in his own right, but an experimental okay. one. But he was a theoretical physicist and, and, and like Albert Einstein. Or, right. I do um, the math and I figure out the secrets yeah. of the world, universe. I figure out the secrets of the universe, yeah. yeah. Um, or his uh, – or um, yeah, it's uh, – and so you have all of those things. And he has this sort of crisis of faith and it gets into something that, that in the movie makes a little bit more explicit than whether we know if it actually happened or not. But there's this sort of infamous Apple incident where his, okay. his professor really pissed him off one day. And, and it's unsure whether Oppenheimer actually did this or if this was just like a fever dream he had or like a fantasy he had. But basically he took in his chemistry classes, he basically took like some like toxic, like toxic, you know, chemicals and put them into an apple on his professor's desk for him to eat and, and be poisoned by. <laughs> and it's very unclear in the historical research whether or not Oppenheimer ever actually did this. Okay. Um, he may have just sort of thought it up. Um, but uh, but the movie sort of makes it more explicit, like he actually did do it. Okay. Um, it's but, pretty extreme uh, reaction to a professor placing you off. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was a professor who, um, you know, that just he just didn't really like. He really, really didn't like. <laughs> and um, and so he just uh, he decided, I'm okay. I might do this, or at the very least, he thought about it. He he had a daydream about killing his teacher. He had a daydream about his about. He had a daydream <laughs> about killing his teacher, or he may have intentionally almost have done it. Um, okay. Because his teacher didn't die, so right. it's so. a question of whether or not he actually did that. Um, but what really, what really helped him was um, recognizing that, like, he was in the wrong place. So mm. he goes to Germany. He goes to the University of Göttingen, and that's where he studies under uh, Max Born and becomes a theoretical physicist and and receives his doctorate in theoretical physics. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have any comments? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I guess earlier, uh, some random geek said, you mean there are problems with big atom bobs in the world, world. politics scene? That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. true. We'll, and we're going to get to that. <laughs> and um, then, uh, Velkin999 just said, hey, who hasn't? Right. I mean, we've all had a teacher that's really pissed us off. The question yeah. on is whether we pulled the trigger on that or not. <laughs> that's right. Um, generally, you don't. <laughs> you, generally, you don't. Um, I, I kind of lean on the side that it was sort of probably an elaborate fever dream he had in yeah. his head. Um, that probably never really happened. Um, but, uh, cause like his professor didn't die. So, you know, um, <laughs> or get sick. So, you know, um, but it's very dramatic. So that's so, like why yeah, it's in like, the movie. So either he was really bad at chemistry or, yeah. <laughs> or, or he didn't do it <laughs> or he didn't do it. Yeah. It's either he was really bad or he didn't do it. So in the 1930s, in the United States, there really wasn't a university devoted to theoretical physics. And so that's his charge. So he comes home from graduating uh, and getting his doctorate in theoretical physics. He comes back to the United States and he set up the theoretical physics department at the University of California, Berkeley, the UC okay. Berkeley. And he starts doing some really interesting theoretical physics works, uh, especially, especially related to quantum physics, which was becoming, becoming the kind of the big new thing at the time. Um, and there were many theoreticians who were sort of trying to develop the, 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 the intricacies of what the quantum world might mean for us. So he was at the same time, he was developing this, um, this new physics department. It's UC Berkeley, 
right? So it's it's a, this is a university known for its political radicalism. A lot of people often think of the free speech movement in the 1960s with Berkeley. Um, but the radical politics of Berkeley go way back and, and they actually really do go back to the 20s and the 30s. Okay. And specifically those who were involved with the, the Communist Party of the United States. Um, and specifically, it's sort of California iterations. Right. And so the real backbone to the book is thinking about who Robert Oppenheimer was in the context of all of the sweeping historical movements that are happening all around him. So he wasn't particularly politically interested until um, the 30s. So, you know, growing up, he lived a fairly isolated life. You know, you grow up in a solidly middle class home, you go to good schools, you, you, you know, you're a theoretical physicist, like you don't often think that much about politics. Yeah. What changes him is the Spanish Civil War. Okay. And the, and the fight for a Republican, small r Republican government in Spain yeah. um, and those fighting for freedom. And so this is kind of the moment that galvanizes him where he starts paying attention. And specifically, it's really two things, the Spanish Civil War and the rise of Hitler in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Oppenheimer was, was acutely aware of the fact that he was Jewish. And, uh, and that a lot of his friends and colleagues and family, of course, were Jewish. And he was seeing the developments of fascism abroad and was very afraid, you know, and, and I think it, it sort of made him wake up and become a more um, worldly person. And so uh, he starts donating money to the cause of the Spanish Civil War. And he does this through Communist Party channels. Mm. So um, he will start sort of, he starts sending money off to, you know, you know freedom fighters in, in Spain, especially those of what was called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who were Americans who went over to fight the war. Um, and including the, the husband of Oppenheimer's future wife, um, uh, Kitty, uh, who's who, who? One of her husbands was a, a Spanish Civil War fighter who died in the Spanish Civil War. Okay, and that's uh, that's kind of how they bond. He and Oppenheimer and and his wife Kitty. Um, so Oppenheimer was, I think, like a lot of people, I think that he was very idealistic. Um, I identify with him a lot because, like, I feel I feel in a sense that sometimes I am idealistic to the point of being naive, right. and I think that's kind of what he was, and didn't really recognize the problems of of doing certain things. So, so of course, so he's given money to the Spanish part, the mm -hmm. Spanish fighters. He's he's um, starting to get involved in organizing uh, workers in the labs at Berkeley and his fellow students, <laughs> and. Uh, this freaks out some of his university colleagues, especially Ernest Lawrence, who was um, was part of the theory, who was part of the experimental physics department at Berkeley, okay. who was politically a conservative and uh, was like, "Why are you doing? Like, you got to cut this shit out." <laughs> and in the movie, they have this great dialogue in the movie where it's like, "I can't bring you, I can't tell you certain things about what's going on." because you're doing all of this left wing shit. Like I can't, I can't bring you in on doing something important that you should be doing because I can't trust you. And, and some of that I think is, is, is really frustrating, I think for us, but Oppenheimer was somebody who, who there was always charges that he was an informal member of the communist party. The, the, the research basically indicates that he probably wasn't. Um, that he never was a actual like card carrying member of the communist party. But what he had yeah. done was he had associated himself with known communists. Um, he had, da he dated a woman who was a known communist for years. Her name was Jean Tatlock. Okay. Um, and, and then his brother Frank did, and his wife did become members of the communist party. Okay. So his brother is a communist. His girlfriend is a member of the communist party. His best friend is a member, is a member of the communist party or, or adjacent to them, Hoke and Chevalier. So it kind of lends you, like you think of all the people around him are communists. He probably has one too, but it's like, he never actually joined the party. At least right. it, it doesn't look clear. Martin Sherwin, one of the co-authors of the book said there was later evidence to suggest that maybe he was, but it was very, very unclear. And Oppenheimer maintained till his, his entire life that he was never a formal member of the party. 
Um, but yeah, he, yeah, I mean, a yeah. person can have like affinities and uh, you know feel empathetic towards a certain cause without actually joining the organization. So exactly, in the language of the time, he is what we would call a fellow traveler. Right. Um, that was the kind of the language, and so, um, and so yeah, so like he was never a part of it, but he would he was connected to it in sort of adjacent ways. So the world really changes in a couple really specific ways in the 1930s. First is uh, September 1st, 1939 is when the Nazis invade Poland and it's the beginning of World War II. Second thing that happens is that around that same time, Albert Einstein and a colleague write a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt basically saying that an atomic bomb is theoretically possible and that the Nazis know that too and that they might be developing it on their own. Okay. And this is the moment where the American government sort of recognizes, okay, we have to become serious now. And this is where you get the beginnings of the Manhattan Project, um, mm-hmm. which is named the Manhattan Project because some of it's based out of New York, some of it's based out of Chicago, some of okay. it's based out of Tennessee, which is where the where the radioactive materials are made. And then the experimental and then the testing sites are all in New Mexico, specifically Los Alamos, New Mexico. Okay. Um, Oppenheimer once said, my two great loves in life are physics and New Mexico, if only I could combine them. And, uh, and then he eventually did. Um, and so he begins to um, sort of temper his left-wing activities, and that makes the American government comfortable enough to sort of bring him on board. Okay. And so uh, General Leslie Groves, um, who uh, was sort of one of the commanding officers in charge of the Manhattan Project, made Robert Oppenheimer the director of the Manhattan Project. Um, so he oversaw everything. And so he was as much a physicist as he was a politician. He was somebody who was sort of put in a position to have to manage a bunch of different people um, and kind of work with them and make sure that they're, um, you know, working to their highest standards and trying to do the best they can to try to develop the bomb. Because the whole goal was to develop the bomb before the Nazis did. Mm-hmm. And then if we could, that that could end the war, that it could end the war in a short way. Now, we looking back on it in the, 20, like in, the, in the guise of the 21st century, we could look at it and go, maybe that wasn't the smartest deal on the planet. Uh, there's a historian I really like named Peter Watson who's written, has written an excellent book about this, um, about how some of the, the intentions of creating the atomic bomb project were sort of extremely problematic for the start and based on some really bad false assumptions, made some really false assumptions. The thing is, is that, it's, that the, the German government was in such disarray by the time you get into the, to the later part of the war that, that the theoretical physics, uh, the, the, the lab in Germany, in Nazi Germany, devoted to the atomic bomb project was never close. It never, ever really got close. Um, and so there's an argument to be made that, well, if we had known that, would we have done it too? You know. Um, and so uh, they, they work on this project. There are a variety of different people who work in this project, including Hans Bethe, who, was, who led the theoretical division at Los Alamos, um, Robert Serber, um, uh, What's his name? Rossi Lamanens. There was a bunch of different people who were involved in the project, including Edward Teller, who was another one who will become a Pearson. We'll talk about a little bit. Okay. Um, and so they work on this essentially for three years. So it's really starting in 1941, 1942, up until the Trinity test in July of 1945. And there's a discussion at the time, and this plays in the movie too, There was a discussion at the time that there was a very small possibility that if we let off a nuclear bomb, that it would ignite the atmosphere and and destroy everything on the planet. And they couldn't good thing. (laughs) And they couldn't prove that. And they could not prove that until they dropped one. And so they're basically like theoretically, you know, we're like 99% sure that won't happen, but we don't know for sure. And so when the Trinity it's okay. One percent. One percent. Whatever. <laughs> and um, and so in the so when they finally do the Trinity tests in July of 1945, it's it's very unclear whether one it'll even work, and two if it does, will it destroy the planet? Mm. Well, one it did work. It worked very well. And two, 
Uh, it did not destroy the planet. Not yet, anyway. Right. Um, and, and so once the, the bomb was successful, there were two bombs that were made, um, which, of course, are known to history now as Fat Man and Little Boy. And those were dropped in August of 1945 on yeah. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, Oppenheimer was in discussions of the highest level about dropping the bombs. Um, and the, and let's, let's take a back step real quick. Cause okay. one crucial element here that's very important is 1945 is a very crucial year. Obviously you have July, 1945, the Trinity test is, is successful. Right. But in April of 1945, FDR dies, dies of a stroke mm, right. at his, at his, um, retreat in warm Springs, which makes Fucking Harry Truman. <laughs> Harry Truman becomes the, the the 33rd president of the United States. And Harry Truman, holy shit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to try to turn this into the fuck Harry Truman hour, but there's a part of me that wants to. Yeah. So if we want to talk about the rise of the national security state in the modern American empire, you really can't talk about it without talking about Harry Truman. So Roosevelt was much more conciliatory towards the Soviet Union. Um, at the time, during the Second World War, the United States and Soviet Union were allies, which is something that I don't think people always think about or know. Yeah. They they don't remember that. They they don't really remember that. And so, when when Eisenhower no Eisenhower when when Ro Roosevelt dies and Truman becomes president, there's a there's a real shift that happens where instead of trying to be more conciliatory and work and working with the Soviet Union to build a sort of post World War II world, uh, the United States take the United States takes a way more antagonistic approach towards the Soviet Union, yeah. and Truman is a key architect of that, and so um, the reason that they really needed to test it in July of 1945 was that um, Truman was meeting with Churchill and Stalin at Potsdam. You have the Potsdam conference that happens at the time. So they, they drop the bomb. The Trinity test happens when Truman's at Potsdam and Oppenheimer, when he was in discussions about dropping the bombs, um, there was a very real discussion among people who worked in the Manhattan project, whether it was ethical to drop it at all. Right. Um, and because, well, the Nazis are going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to, um, you know, they are already at this point, they had already, um, been defeated. They yeah. had already given up. Yeah. Um, the and war so Japan, was essentially over the war was essentially winding down. Um, but there was this argument that had come out of the, 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 the sort of war planners that, well, if we don't drop the atomic bombs, then, uh, the, we're going to have a long protracted land war in Asia that could lead to the deaths of a half a million people in and half a million servicemen uh, uh, of the allies and, you know, hundreds of thousands of Japanese. And, right. so it's, and so they make the argument that like, well, if we make this, if we drop the bomb, then we can stop the war at a lot quicker than we would otherwise. I think history has ruled out that that was, that wasn't really true. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, uh, uh, there's a great book called the decision to, to use or the decision to drop the atomic bomb. I think it's by Gara Pervovitz. I have it. Um, but it's a great book that kind of lays out the history of it. And essentially the Japanese were ready to surrender. They were right. ready. Like they, they knew that their, their time was, was pretty, was coming pretty short. And so they were fairly close to giving the Americans an unconditional surrender, which is what we wanted or the United States wanted. Um, and, but, this gets into what really is the real reason why we dropped the bombs. So the, the, ex the official reason is to end the war, but that's not really why we do it. Yeah. Um, the real reason we do it is to, is as a, as a sort of a big notice or a warning to the Soviet union that we have this and you don't. So don't cross us. Yeah. Um, at the Potsdam conference, after President Truman had learned that the atomic bomb, the Trinity test was successful, um, Oppenheimer had recommended that the president be fully candid with Stalin about the atomic bomb project and mm -hmm. maybe even work with them to, um, you know, maybe to maybe not use it, to let them know that we had it and to be more candid. Right. Truman did not do that. Um, Truman, 
Truman decided to be more coy and um, essentially say, I have something in my back pocket now and, uh, and the United States uh, is going to be the unchallenged leader of the global order going forward. <laughs> and that's really like, the, the, there are these like moments because yeah. you can make the argument that like being the father of the atomic bomb is like a horrific crime in and of itself. And Oppenheimer had to live with that for the rest of his life and like all of that. Yeah. But he was building the bomb, or at least what he tells us is from his own recollections. The reason he was building it was because he was trying to avoid the, the Nazis from having one. Yeah. And hoped that either we would either not drop it at all, or if we did drop it, because his original recommendation was not to not drop it, but to basically drop it where there weren't any civilians. That yeah. You drop it where no one was. It would just go off. It scare the shit out of people. And then you get a big your, bomb. It's a, big, it's a huge <laughs> bomb, right? It's, uh, to thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons, equivalent to thousands and thousands of tons of TNT. I mean, it's you know the most explosive bomb ever built, ever. Yeah. And so, uh, so that was kind of the original idea. It was like, well, we can either not drop it, or we could drop it where there aren't any any where there isn't anyone. That's again, that's not what the United States decides to do. No. And initially, Oppenheimer was, and again, I think this was his naivete. He sort of said, well, look. I'm the guy who is charged with leading the team, developing the atomic bomb. That's my job. My job isn't about how to use it or why. Those aren't my, that's not my job. Right. So that's kind of this initial approach. After Hiroshima Nagasaki, he drops all that, recognizes, oh my God, I have to, I have to be in on these discussions. So what is the, 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 the result of Hiroshima Nagasaki? Nagasaki. So it's, Hundreds of thousands of dead. Um, some estimates say there was a quarter million people killed in the two bombs that were dropped in August of 1945. Um, millions injured, millions exposed to radiation. Um, horrific, horrific um, uh, loss of human life um, that did end the war. I mean, the Japanese pretty much did uh, uh, give up, um, but they did pretty much surrender. But as a lot of historians have sort of looked at later, like they were already going to surrender. There was no need yeah. to drop the bomb, but they did it anyway. And it was a, it was a signal to the Soviets. Um, it was a complete pivot. So people often wonder, when does the Cold War begin? The Cold War begins mm -hmm. in July of 1945 yeah. when Truman knows that the bomb is here and it works and doesn't let Stalin in on the loop in yeah. the loop on it. And then with the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and sort of sending the message. Um, and so this is, so this gets us into sort of maybe talking about the sort of post Manhattan project part of his life. But um, before we do that, I just want to maybe pause for any comments or questions. Oh, uh, we've got uh nonsequently is here over on Twitch. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we've got uh, what the Beck Showed okay. Up, uh, Thank you. The, on uh, YouTube, <clears throat> and said, uh, "I'm 45 minutes from Los Alamos. A lot of people retire there from there early because their brains don't work correctly anymore." Yeah, that's true. There's there's long term radiation issues, um, and and sort and the argument that they used about using Los Alamos was, "Oh, it's in the middle of nowhere. No one's here." Well, that's not necessarily true. There right. were people there. There were people of there were native people who were there, indigenous people. Um, you know, and there were also people who worked in the project. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty harrowing stuff. Um, you may have in the comments. Uh, some random geek also said we can have a fuck Harry Truman show hour on a future show. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. Yeah. I mean, we can certainly do that and, and, and talk about, you know, the rise of the national security state. So that's where we can kind of pivot and start talking about it. So, the post-war world that ended up being built was very different than the one that Franklin Roosevelt had originally envisioned. Mm. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Truman was much more willing to be a cold warrior and sort of fight the Soviet Union than I think Roosevelt would have been. And certainly Henry Wallace would have been had he been the president. Like had, right. had he been on the ticket in 44 with Roosevelt instead of being replaced by Truman and he had become president in 1945, the world would be a very different place. Right. We either wouldn't have dropped the bomb at all, or we would have, we wouldn't have dropped it on civilians. Right. 
Um, and I, I, I do believe that. And, and so, uh, so you have the growth of the national security straight, the Truman doctrine that is developed in the forties. Um, that essentially says, you know, if you strike at us, we will absolutely blow you away. Like there's no, there's, you know, we will be absolutely disproportional in terms of how we strike back. And so this is really where Oppenheimer pivots from being scientist to administrator to policymaker. So he becomes a part of something called the AEC or the Atomic Energy Commission. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then he also becomes a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which is where Einstein was for many okay. years. And the Institute was set up for Einstein um, for theoretical physics and for other disciplines. Um, Oppenheimer was somebody who deeply wanted to blend the sciences and the humanities, which is kind of rare, I think, with scientists. Um, but he was somebody who who would have poets and have, you know, uh, you know, uh, novelists and people who would creative types and then also physicists right. when during his tenure in the Institute for Advanced Study. And the there's a few developments that kind of happen. One, the Soviets have their own bomb and that drops sometime in the late 1940s, I think 49, maybe a little later. And this is a huge like bombshell, like literally and figuratively, like how the hell did the Soviets have the bomb? We didn't tell them anything. We kept them out of the loop. Well, it turns out that there was sure. a spy. There was a spy at the Manhattan Project. Okay. Um, and his name was his name was Klaus Fuchs, um, who was a Soviet spy. So he was the one feeding information to the Soviets about what the Manhattan Project was doing, because the Americans was weren't going to share it with the Soviets, which is yeah. actually what Oppenheimer had wanted. Okay. Anything that we had sort of developed, he wanted within reason and within national security restraints, he wanted it to be shared with the Soviets. So they knew what was going on yeah. because they're our allies. Yeah, that's right. And, and in the war. And so that there was the hope that if they could, that if we could let them in on it, then we could develop a very responsible post-war order. And so the Soviets that's had their own bomb. what Truman wanted. <laughs> Is that what Truman wanted? No, right? So, you know, Truman was a Cold Warrior. I mean, he sort of cut his teeth politically as a U.S. senator fighting against corruption in U.S. military contracts. This is kind of how he sort of gains his national profile. And then uh, he's put on the ticket essentially to placate the Southern Democrats who were not comfortable with the fourth FDR term. Yeah. And they said, you put Truman on the ticket, we'll go for it. And so instead of having sort of a Westerner like Henry Wallace, who was certainly more liberal, that wasn't going to do. So they replaced him with, with Truman. And of course, FDR dies within months of the beginning of his fourth term. Yeah. And Truman wanted to build a national security state that would be unlike anything that really the United States had had before. So for most of American history, for most conflicts, after the conflict ended, the U.S. military would sort of pare down. Um, and, and, and would become less and less an aspect of the, of the sort of American life and the American budget and so on. That ends with the Second World War. So we pivot right from World War II into the Cold War with the Truman Doctrine, the development of the, Nash, the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which is a military alliance that still exists to this day. Yeah. Um, excuse me, that was set up as a bulwark against the Warsaw Pact, which was the Eastern European countries that connect were connected with the Soviet Union, um, who set up their own military alliance. And and so you have that. You have the development of the hydrogen bomb, um, which Oppenheimer was very much against. Um, and Edward Teller, his colleague at Los Alamos, was very much for and sort of became the leading cheerleader for um, the hydrogen bomb and became mm -hmm. kind of a darling to the 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 political establishment because he was willing to be the warmonger like they were right there's a famous story of of and there's different accounts of it but there's a famous story of oppenheimer meeting truman because oppenheimer learned of the dropping of the bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki just like the american public did he learned on it through the radio right but they didn't call him to let him know before they he just found out the way everybody else did so they kept him out of the loop. They kept most of the Manhattan Project people out of the loop until they dropped it, until mm -hmm. Truman was on the radio. And uh, But one thing that I think Oppenheimer wanted to do early on and could have been very different, we could live in a very different world, was he had developed uh, and written a, a policy proposal. Um, and this was in sort of the late 
1940s. And it was called the Atchison Lilienthal Report. Now, Oppenheimer wrote most of it, but it's it's named for Dean Atchison, who was an undersecretary of state at the time, who would become secretary of state under Truman, and David Lilienthal, who was another foreign policy planner who had who had been a friend of Oppenheimer's for years. So Oppenheimer was very clued into the American, the development of the American national security state in the early stages as a part, as an advisor to the Atomic Energy Commission. And was warning against the development of the of the hydrogen bomb, which was, you know, I think a hundred times worse or some magnitude worse than the standard atomic bomb that was right. dropped um, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he develops the Atchison Lilienthal report, which is when you read it today, it's actually kind of radical, like what he wanted to do, which was that he wanted to put all nuclear energy policy and development of nuclear energy into the hands of an international commission that would own not only the technology, but would also own the raw materials to make n- nuclear things. So no one say, say uh, no one state, no one country would be in charge of it. No one country would be a part of it. Um, but it would have sort of security guarantees by the United States. So he drafts this report thinking that the, the foreign policy planners would go on board with it. Mm. And they just don't. Uh, yeah. they, they bring in somebody named um, Bernard Baruch, who was like this old school politician, policy planner to come in and basically bastardize the report. Um, and they completely ignored Oppenheimer's recommendations. They sort of saw this idea of creating a global atomic energy structure that was owned publicly, that wasn't owned by private corporations, that corporations would then have to like get clearances by this international body to do any kind of atomic energy work. Um, uh, yeah. they, they just saw that as this, that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. And, uh, and it's so not this, in American interests, it's not in the American security interests, right? Right. So between the Atchison Lilienthal report and Oppenheimer's very public, um, very public critique of the development of the hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer really does start developing enemies. Um, mm. And some of them go all the way up, uh, including FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and so the government starts putting tabs on Oppenheimer for years. I mean, they, they, they followed him for years, mainly just because of his left-wing political activities. Right. Um, his relationship with Gene Tatlock, who was a member of the Communist Party, um, who died of a suicide or rather mysterious circumstances. You take that with you will. The right. movie actually does a great job of like making it unclear how she actually died. So, okay. you know, it's ruled a suicide, but the evidence is, is a little murky on it. So, you know, let you sit with that, which you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, you yeah. know, uh, but, uh, and so this is really where we get to talk about the another key figure in the Oppenheimer saga, and that is Louis Strauss. Okay. Um, and Louis Strauss was a politician. He was essentially a bureaucrat. He was someone who was never elected to like a position. He was somebody who sort of got up in government and took on these sort of bureaucratic jobs. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who brings Oppenheimer to the Institute for Advanced Study, um, of which he's a part of the board. And then, of course, he's he's also a board member of the Atomic Energy Commission. Strauss is a political conservative. Um, okay. his, his name is actually spelled Strauss, but he never says it like that. It's it's pronounced Strauss. He's like okay. from the South or whatever. Um, in the movie, he's played by Robert Downey Jr. He's like the bad guy. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, um, and so Strauss uh, starts to um, kind of starts putting, planting the seeds of what would be the destruction of Robert Oppenheimer's life and career. Yeah. So, what they do is, is uh, and again, this is the peak of McCarthyism, right? Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin leading these, these ridiculous show trials in the Senate um, uh, saying, well, I have this list of these communists, which the number would change depending on the day and how much he had had to drink. Course, yeah. um, and so there's this period of paranoia and suspicion. And that's what the, the early national security state grows in light of all of these changes. So, you know, at the time, people very much believed that communism was a monolith. There was monolithic communism. Mm -hmm. So you have the Soviet Union, who is one of the key victors of the Second World War. They lose 25, 27 million people in the conflict. And shortly after the war, the United States has a series of sort of policy failures on their end. 
failures in that they don't they don't they 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 ensure that the US doesn't have complete and total dominance over certain regions. Right. One is what they call the loss of China in 1949 when the uh the Chinese revolution happens and the communists gain control of China. And then a few years later, there's the Korean War, which ends in a stalemate. And there's a partition between North and South, which is still in existence today. So after a series of failures policy-wise, the United States kind of looked um, like it needed a win. And that's what we'll be talking about next time when we talk about Vietnam. But Ah. – so that's to set that part up. Too bad that didn't turn out the way they were. Yeah, it turned out. Exactly. (laughs) So so you have the development of – um, the de- before world, you know, before the Cold War, before Truman, it was called the Department of War. It was the Secretary of War, right? Yeah, and it becomes the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, um, and the Defense Department instead of the War Department. Um, you have the development of the National Security Council. So the National Security Act is passed in the late 1940s. You have the setup of um, you have the setup of containment theory. Um, connected to George Kennan, the policy uh, foreign policy wonk, who was actually friends with Oppenheimer, um, and the development of containment. So it's like, well, if we make sure that, well, if this country goes communist, the domino theory, then this other country will go communist, and this other country will go communist. The problem with the theory of monolithic communism is that it was a, it was basically not true. The, the mm-hmm. Soviets had a different idea of what they wanted to be than Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia had a different way of what it wanted to be from China, and China yeah. had a different way it wanted to be than Korea. Like it's, they all kind of had their own specific interests, and especially by the 1960s, you get into what we've talked about before, the Sino-Soviet split. Yep, yeah, yeah. And so you have the development of the National Security Council, you have the Department of Defense, you have peacetime economic, like peacetime military spending at highest levels in the country's history. And there's a, I believe a U.S. Senator who, who talks to um, Truman. He's like, you're going to have to scare the shit out of the American people to get them to go along with this because there had never been this kind of military spending in peacetime in American history. And so that was what they did. And they did it through the scaremongering about communism, which of course bled into the McCarthy era where Anybody who was even remotely connected to communism ended up having their lives or their careers destroyed by a character assassination. And Oppenheimer was one of the victims of this. Um, So he was never interviewed by McCarthy. He was never in front of HUAC or anything really like that. Um, But but what happens is, is in 1954, 53, 54, uh, his security clearance is up for renewal. And... His security clearance had always been kind of a questionable thing that was sort of given provisionally because he was the head of the Manhattan Project. And there were serious doubts about whether the U.S. government ever really wanted to give him a security clearance, but they did because they recognized his contributions. Um, And the Atomic Energy Commission, who is in charge of his security clearance, decides to set up a review board. So his... His um, security clearance was rescinded. His renewal of his security clearance was rescinded, um, but could be appealed, and the appeal would be held by a board. Hmm. This board is then led by um, a gentleman named Gray, so it's called the Gray Board. And the Gray Board is is a trial in, in everything but name. And Oppenheimer basically has to defend his life and his entire his entire life and everything he'd ever done and any questionable relationship he'd ever had to these people. Um, and the, um, the, uh, the atomic energy commission under Strauss, cause Strauss is the architect of all of this. He's setting this all up to destroy Oppenheimer's career because right. Oppenheimer would not get with the program. This is like, this is the key thing here, right? Even if you do everything that your country asks of you, if you even merely question it at certain key points, it will throw you under the bus. Yeah. Okay. This is a lesson for people, yeah. you know, that, that patriotism can only go so far. You have to question the, 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 the reasonableness of a certain level of patriotism yeah. because Oppenheimer didn't do that and he paid for it dearly. So they brought up all this sort of dirty laundry about Oppenheimer. Um, the fact that he did have a years long affair with a, a known communist party member in Gene Tatlock. Um, the fact that he wasn't completely and f- completely forthright about his relationship with Hoke and Chevalier, who was his friend, who was a professor at Berkeley, who 
they had a conversation during the middle of the Manhattan Project where um, Chevalier had let Oppenheimer know that he had sort of a courier that could, if if Oppenheimer wanted to, a courier that could give things to the Soviets. Mm. And this guy was George Eltonton. Um, that that uh, and Oppenheimer said no. That's like committing treason. I'm not doing that. But Oppenheimer never fully gave the name of the people he uh, the person that who brought this to him. He mm. tried to keep the name out of it because right. he because he cared about his friend. Right. So it was like, he didn't want to throw his friend under the bus. Um, and it was very honest. Uh, you know, they, they asked him in the gray board, like, why didn't you, why weren't you more honest with us about who the person you talked to was? He said, because I was an idiot. And, I mean, that's what he says word for word, because I was an idiot. Um, he should have said Chevalier's name and he didn't. Um, and so, but again, Oppenheimer was very forthright about the fact that he had had this conversation with someone that they had asked him if he wanted to be a spy for the Soviets. And he had said no, right. he flat out said no. And he told American officials as soon as it happened, what it was. And, and he told them, no, he just wouldn't give them the name. Right. And that was the problem. So he gave them everything they wanted and, and including his loyalty, but not the name because he cared about his friend. Right. Um, because if you want, it, you you cannot have friends if you want to be a part of the American national security state. What's what's that great quote from Kissinger? It's 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 unfortunate to be an enemy of the United States, but it's dangerous to be a friend. Right. And, uh, and I think that's kind of right. And so uh, all this stuff comes to light. His his the fact that his ex his, his wife Kitty was a member of the Communist Party at some time, that he had had an affair with somebody who was a member of the Communist Party, that his brother was a member of the Communist Party, that his best friend was a member of the Communist Party who, who gave him an opportunity to sell secrets. All this comes to light in the gray board. But Oppenheimer's innocent. He didn't do anything right. wrong other than have what we might think of as not necessarily shady relationships, but relationships with people that could be questionable at the height of McCarthyism. And they... People they, we would say are the good guys, actually. <laughs> People you could make the argument are the good guys, right? And the thing is, like, Frank Oppenheimer actually comes on board the Manhattan Project later on um, right. as an experimental physicist to help with the project. And at the, by that point, he'd already left the Communist Party. Okay. Um, because by the time you get into the early to mid-40s, people start hearing about – Stalin's show trials and the purges and like mm. people start hearing about what's going on in the Soviet Union and people leave the party. The party never really recovers from that. Um, and Jean Tatlock herself was never 100% like committed to the party. No one really was. Uh, you know, the, the only radical political energies that were doing anything in the 30s were the communists. So if you wanted to get something done, you'd do something with that. Right, right. Um, but – you know, but, but Oppenheimer wasn't that, you know, he was, a, he was sort of a new deal progressive liberal, you know, maybe a democratic socialist in the most radical, yeah. like if you want to make him paint him the most radical Some light. leftish yeah. leanings and. Yeah, left leaning guy, you know, but he was never, he never identified as a communist and he was never a communist party member. But because of all of these associations that he had had and the fact that he'd not been fully honest with military officials about his, his conversations with Chevalier. This is what kills his career, and he loses his security clearance with the Atomic Energy Commission, um, and and ultimately it sort of ends his formal career in policymaking. So it's a lesson, I think, that the American national security state was not willing to put up with critics, yeah, especially critics that were beloved, because Oppenheimer was beloved by the American public, you know, right? Um, and so, so much of a threat is, yeah, and so he spends the rest of his life. He continues his position at, at, at Princeton, um, at the, the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, basically, he continues to do talks and lectures and continues to do phys physics work, but he stops really commenting on policy. He stops making points about policy and goes into relative recluse for the rest of his life. Um, and he dies in 1967 uh, relatively young, um, of uh, esophageal cancer. Um, yeah, he was a lifelong smoker. Yeah. I mean, even, even on the cover of the book, he's got a cigarette in his mouth. Um, right. dude was a chain smoker basically. Um, and so what are the lessons to take away from a story like Oppenheimer's? I think one is the limits of patriotism. I think yeah. that 
uh, I also think that um, he was somebody who became a casualty of McCarthyism and a casualty of the growth of the American national security state, where in this system, and this is something we're going to talk about more when we talk about Vietnam and the best and the brightest next time. If you are somebody within the system who challenges the assumptions of said system, yeah. you will not advance. And if anything, you might be you might be harmed for it. Yeah. Now was Oppenheimer. He was somebody who questioned some of the base assumptions of the national security state and they punished him for it. Yeah. Um, but if you accept the assumptions, regardless of how wrong they may be, you will advance. Yeah. And that's the case with somebody like Edward Teller, who was one of the big champions of the atomic of the hydrogen bomb and worked very closely with the government to develop it. Um, even though it was questionable ethically. Um, so, you know, Oppenheimer's story is one of thinking about the, the a real, he, he sort of lost, it's, it's America sort of losing its innocence mm -hmm. and that, um, that America is no longer a place that is fully committed to, you know, the project of democratic government, that it's, that's right. truly, that it's truly becoming an empire in every sense of the word, that things right. become increasingly more autocratic decisions are made more and more in the dark. Yeah. Um, and that, that much of it is being made by people you've never met who you don't know. Yeah. And that is, I think, those are consequences we still live with today. And so I think Oppenheimer's story is a lesson in how one navigates the currents of uh, what we would kind of think of as organized insanity. Yeah, um, for sure. Because that's kind of what the American empire is. I mean, it's kind of organized insanity. Like the fact that nuclear weapons were made as much as they were made and that the lies about them were continually pushed by the government yeah. and pushed by elected officials and the lies about the Soviets and all of that, where they misled the public consistently in pursuance of the of a broader goal, which was the growth and continuation of the American empire and the national security state. Yeah. And I think in general, as Americans and as people in the world generally, um, I think that we're less free and less safe as as a result of all of this growth of yep. military spending and military weaponry and not thinking um I think honestly about it. I think when I think when your government is keeping secrets from you and pretending that it's in the national security, I think that that's uh, that's not democracy anymore. Yeah. I think so. And I think that um that uh, the United States has this push and pull between the Republic and the empire. Yeah. You know, and ultimately for much of the 20th century and the early 21st century, the empire is one. Yeah. And so I think that Oppenheimer's story is one that we can learn from to think about how we might get our democracy back about how we might build our democracy back. Maybe we won't make the same kind of mistakes that, that people like Oppenheimer made yeah. and, and, and maybe challenge assumptions yeah, because that's the big thing is that he didn't challenge assumptions for so long and was, was rewarded for it. But the moment that he started to challenge the base assumptions of it, that was when he was punished. I, I know we're going to, we're going yeah. kind to of talk about it more with the Vietnam episode and, uh, but it is, it is a consistent theme throughout American history that uh, there are, the people who question the base assumptions get tossed out and people who don't get put in. Yep. <laughs> it happened pretty much. It happened in Vietnam. It happened in, it happened in North Korea. It happened in Vietnam. It happened in uh, Iraq. It like, it, it's the way that it runs. Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah. Libya. I mean, yeah, I think it is that there are base assumptions of the national security state, which are not challenged. Yeah. And if you challenge them, you are thrown out of positions of power. Yeah. And so um, I think that that is the key lesson. I want to leave you with um, a quote of Oppenheimer's. Um, so he, shortly after uh, the, the Gray Board's decision in 1954, uh, around this time, he publishes a book that's a collection of his um, speeches. And the book is called The Open Mind. And okay. it has this great quote, which if you read it, it's kind of incredible. And 
And it's definitely, I think, a great summation of his sort of theoretical framework or his sort of humanistic philosophy. Um, and something that I think people should learn to, I think, recognize for its importance. So he says in his book, The Open Mind, an indispensable, perhaps the indispensable element in giving meaning to the dignity of man and in making possible the taking of decision on the basis of honest conviction is the openness of men's minds and the openness of whatever media there are for communion between men free of restraint, free of repression, and free even of that most pervasive of all restraints, that of status and hierarchy. Um, and so, you know, he was a man of the left, despite his limitations. And obviously, we can certainly talk about the ethical role of him being involved in creating the bomb. Right. But I think that he was somebody who was tortured by it, um, yeah. deeply, deeply tortured about it, by it, um, and recognized that the world that he was instrumental in making was one that he could no longer effectively help control yeah. because he wasn't going to be allowed to. Um, and so, yeah, that is the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer and, and the sort of the, how his life became the subject of a blockbuster movie and is sort of caught the zeitgeist because I think people are still considering the questions about nuclear weapons, right? Sure. We live in a world that is increasingly more dangerous because of nuclear weapons, yeah. um, especially nuclear weapons that are held by countries like Russia or Israel who, yeah. or the United States yeah. um, who have nuclear weapons uh, yeah. and, and have more than enough to destroy everything on earth multiple times over. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. And provide incentive for people that they consider enemies to also develop more nuclear weapons and like, you know, say what you want about like North Korea or Iran or, or mm -hmm. any of these other places, but like the United States has provided them with an incentive to defend themselves with the same tools that the United States has. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's kind of a, a it, it's a deeply rationalized form of, ra of irrationality where it's, it's yeah. rational to do, to, to have your own d development of your own nuclear program because, you know, if you don't, yeah. chances are at some point you're going to get invaded by the United States, <laughs> yep. uh, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, he, he Oppenheimer was involved in the government at the time. It was at the cusp of the beginnings of the development of the CIA and the mass terror programs under the CIA, the, the murders of of foreign leaders, the coups against governments, the slaughter of innocent civilians, the the. the the untold atrocities committed by the government of the United States. And he is somebody who is kind of at the cusp of what that represents in the 20th century yeah. and recognizes it for what it is, which is horrors on of untold end. Yeah. And I think it kind of, uh, I think it kind of destroys him. Uh, I think as it would any person who had any sense of a conscience that, it, you know, um, yeah, as, as a person with an ethical framework, you're going to feel like, yeah, you, you're going to feel terrible. Shitty. So before we finish up, do we have any comments, questions from the, from uh, the peanut gallery? We, we did have a couple. Um, when we were discussing uh, Japan, uh, Vulcan 999 said, it's crazy Japan does business with the U.S. even after nuking them. It is pretty crazy, right? But part of that was it was um, it was – Economic development and ultimately, like, yes, the Japanese were part of the fascist coalition, the Axis powers during the war, but like their their interests were fairly aligned with the United States for most of the 20th century and were quite imperial on their own end, especially in relation to China and yep. Cuba yep. and Vietnam, not Cuba, but uh, China and Korea and Vietnam yep. and Laos. So, like, you know, if it, they're they're much more birds of a feather than you might think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Japan kind of went hyper capitalist, right? Yes. So, and before that, it had been hyper imperialist uh, during the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and also, part of it was the massive economic package. You know, it was it was the the, the Marshall Plan, both for e Europe, Western Europe after the war, but also for Japan. There was huge amounts of economic relief in Japan by the United States. Right. Um, and so. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is it's if you're vanquished, it's 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 uh, at some point you, you know that like this is my best shot of getting 
the country back together. So let's just go with it. You yeah. Know? Yep. But it is crazy. Um, some random geek, when we were talking about uh, McCarthy, he said, or he had fries with ketchup that day and said, there are 57 He's commies not- in the government. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and McCarthy himself would leave the Senate in disgrace and die shortly thereafter. Um, and, uh, and people recognized what he was doing uh, right away, which was just at some point they recognized that this was – this was not about actually keeping Americans safe or challenging the problems of communism, but in reality was a witch hunt against, you know, mo- uh, many sensible Americans who may have left leaning political views. But last I checked, the United States is supposed to be a free country with freedom of speech and association and people shouldn't be persecuted for their political it's beliefs. Supposed to be. Supposed to be, you know, but you <laughs> yeah. know, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot uh, easier said than done. Yeah. And finally, uh, some random geek said, Defense Department is a nice spin name for your War Department. Right, right. Because yeah. think about it, right? I mean, it's it's very much like post uh, post 9-11, you have the, de- the de- development of the Department of Homeland Security, which in any era, you know, sounds super fascist to me, but like, and it still does, like the <laughs> Homeland, what the yeah. fuck is this shit? But post um, 9-11, I mean. It's very post 9-11, right? But it's like, Homeland, got to protect the Homeland, or it's yeah. like, we have to, it's, we're, this is defense, we're, we're funding, this is the defense bill, it's not the war bill, it's not the, the military bill, it's yeah. the defense bill. Yeah, for sure. But that's it for comments, so I guess. All righty. Uh, We've discussed it a couple times now, but just to be clear, what are we covering next time? So next time we're going to be covering sort of a broader topic and we're going to be talking about a couple of different books. Um, but uh, but the main book that we're going to talk about is The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam, um, which is the classic book on the history of the Vietnam War from the perspective of the, the people who planned it. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, a really excellent book I just finished called Kill Anything That Moves The Real American War in Vietnam by Nick Terse oh. um, to kind of kind of give you a sense of what's really what really happened in the war, because right. Halberstam talks a lot about some of the, the military uh, decisions that were made, some of the battles and things. But mostly he talks about the planners and the politics of it. Right. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened, what the American war was actually like kind and not the, the sort ground. of. Yeah, kind of on the ground or in the air or whatever, you know, and, and the unsanitized version of what, what Americans truly did in Vietnam. Um, and so, and talk about how the Vietnam War was the, I, in my opinion, this, this the pivotal sort of central military event or event of the national security state in America that kind of broke the country. And we've, and the United States has never really recovered from it ever mm. since. Um, so, uh, so that will be next time. Right on. And I guess all that's left then is where can people find you? So you can find me at justinclark.org. There's my website right down there. Um, you can also check out my uh, writing, some of my writing there. You can find all of our podcast episodes at the website. Um, and then uh, you can also find some of my writing at the Untold Indiana blog that I write on for the Indiana Historical Bureau in my day job. Um, and, uh, you can also check out me, check me out on social media. Uh, I'm Justin Clark, PH, PH stands for public history. You can find me on Instagram threads, TikTok, uh, blue sky. I'm mostly active on Instagram. Um, and as I always finish with our episodes, please consider becoming a patron, um, patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, because Corey does a lot of really great work. He's been doing all these wonderful clips that people have been watching and editing the episodes. And he's been doing a lot of really interesting interviews outside of this show. Um, so definitely consider becoming a patron. It'll help us out a lot. Definitely appreciate it. All right. With that, thank you everybody who was in the comment section, everybody who yes, viewed and you. didn't comment. And, uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to all my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of the patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a Patreon and want to contribute to that, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a sub stack where you can subscribe for free, or you can donate once donate per month. 
And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes that is on Patreon. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Uh, Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. There's, there's like the, like, there's massive, like, kind of exploitation and, like, even, like, war almost going on in, like, Congo mm-hmm. looking for, like, various minerals that we use in our own, in our stuff here. Yes. Yes. And it's just, like, and it's all being done with slave labor or through theft of the, you know, no payment to the people that it's being taken from. We're children. Like, yeah. yeah like, I, I think you're right. And and the other part of it too, is that this is like, this is part of the problem. And we've talked about this before. We talked about like renewable energies and I'm not against renewable energies. I'm just saying like right. one of the bigger problems with them is that they require all of these, you know, heavy metals and elements that have to be yeah. pulled at, through mining. I mean, it's, and how are you going to do most of that mining? One, you're going to do it through slave labor or you're going to do it through child labor or yep. regular, you know, regular sort of adult labor, but with horrible conditions. Um, so even if they're paid a wage, it's not fair. And they're under, you know, there's Extremely no worker dangerous. Yeah. There's no fucking OSHA. Like it's not. And the other component to it, too, is that all of the the, 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 the vehicles and the technology that is required to pull all this out of the ground runs on fossil fuels. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's kind of pointless. Like it's like, you know, you're better off just using the fucking fossil fuels because, (laughs) yes, they might be bad for CO2, but like, but at the same time, like so much going on.